Hey guys, don't play around here, okay? Hey! Not very nice. Okay, don't play around this, alright? Sorry, I didn't mean to give you my rear. Uh, 
which is interesting because a lot of times when we think of Francis, we think of the fasting. And, you know, he was very serious about spirituality, but he was also this really joyful uh, person who, who saw this connection between the gospel and loving God and having a good time. Uh, so, Epiphany, the season where we reflect on God is revealing himself to all of humanity. Uh, our inspiration from Francis today that I'll invite you into is to live with joy, that we help share the gospel and how we live with those around us. What about our greatest core values is being a missional community, uh, which just means that church isn't just us sitting here. Our identity is that we're sent into the world. So we're not just here for this gathering, but God sends us as part of the church into the world uh, to proclaim the gospel uh, and how we live and how we talk about Jesus. So. Francis would say, so as you do that, be really joyful. Well, thank you, uh, B, for leading us in uh, all these St. Francis moments. It's been good uh, as the year has gone on, or this last year, to uh, discover a little bit about Francis' life and, and what it is that uh, his life inspires in us as as well. Um, I want to begin today by reading a song together uh, before we sing our call to worship song. And what's great about this space is we can read this really loudly and passionately because this is our own space, kind of. I mean, we can do whatever we want here. There's no lucky lab staff that are, you know, looking and going, what are they doing, those weirdos? Um, we, can, we can feel free to be us and, and, and to really participate in worship. Uh, and I hope you feel that freedom in here, uh, in this space. So why don't we, uh, why don't we stand and uh, let's let's read this song like we mean it, the world, and then we'll uh, sing together. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. He saved.
morning once again, everybody. Um, first, before we start, let me send our kids to their appropriate area for their time of learning and discussion. And if you don't have a seat, uh, now there are several. Uh, there's plenty of seats in this general area if you would like to sit down. Uh, my name is Dustin. I'm one of the pastors and elders here. Uh, I'm most of you. Um, I know that I'm embarrassingly far behind on this, um, so I have to say it's it silly. Um, but just this last spring, we were eating uh, dinner at our neighbor's house, and my neighbor Josh uh, brought out the sriracha, and uh, and he said, "Hey, Dustin, you should try this on whatever it is we were having." And I said, "Okay, you know, I've never really uh, had it before, which I know is crazy, because um, I think." You know, it goes back to biblical ages, but um, but I tried it, and since then, I don't think you can confirm this with Kelly, but I don't think there's been a single food item I've eaten in the last year that I have not put sriracha on. <laughs> I'm talking everything. Um, what's that? Krispy Kreme. There's there's potential there. <laughs> um, but I, it's changed my life in a, in a deep and meaningful way of him sharing this, uh, this, this thing called sriracha with me. Uh, we went through several bottles. Uh, but I, I love it. But I wonder, what about you? Uh, what's something that you didn't know about until somebody clued you into it that ended up with it becoming part of your life in some way? Yeah. Sushi. Sushi. Yeah. I imagine that's a, a common story. That's not something you eat when you're like five years old and you get grow up. I didn't eat it as an adult either because I just had this I just had this preconceived notion that it was all like raw fish. And uh, and then not to mention that that in itself is good, but then when I actually ate it, I was like, I totally get what everybody's been talking about and where have you been all my life? <laughs> so sushi for Stephen. Yeah, well, Downton Abbey. I was, uh, <laughs> I was initially very resistant. Thank you for your courage. I thought I'd have to hand it my man card or something, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like the Bible. Yeah, you know, it's like the Bible. This is also the guy that said, if you watch two episodes of Veronica Mars and you don't love it, I will buy you lunch. That's what you said. <laughs> I typed it up as a note on my phone so I could remember that in case I ever watched the first two episodes of Veronica Mars. It's life. a great show. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, what else? I managed to avoid salad until I was almost out of college. 
and my gateway drug was a cold cut combo from Subway, which uh, I, I tasted and I said, hey, that's, that's actually pretty good. I, I think I can try salad now. And I did. I liked it. But it was a sandwich with meat on it. <laughs> those who help others along. 
in understanding God and life and, and church. There are a lot of positive uh, examples of growth in Scripture, calls to grow. At the end of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. Live in harmony and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. He says in Philippians 1, he says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. You know, and, and the cool thing is, especially as we talked about last week, the cool thing is that in our community, we have grown in some pretty important ways in the last few years, some things that are, are obvious. One of those ways is, is in the area of worship. We've grown in our understanding and our participation in the practice of focusing our heart and our attention to God. Not least of which, I mean that happens in a variety of ways, but not least of which is participating in the gathering and, and, and reading psalms together and, and praying and singing songs. We didn't always used to be that community. There, were a there was a time a long time ago where um, I remember this guy Brian said, you know, after kind of being in one of our worship gatherings, is, is one of your, something like, is one of your core values despair? <laughs> <laughs> because it was just kind of, you know, it was, it was very introspective, I guess you could say. Uh, you know, that was like eight years ago. But that, I, I say that just because you can see how we've grown as a community. We're much more expressive now. Even if you come in here and you think, these people aren't very expressive. We're expressive. <laughs> But we've grown in that. You know, another area we've grown in is, uh, is prayer. It's, it's more common to see people asking one another to pray for them than it used to be. Uh, for, for people coming to the elders and asking for prayer. Or, um, or, or even spending time fasting and praying for discernment. I've heard about that happening more in the last year. Um, there are some, a group of people that gather once a month before the gathering to pray together. And, and not only that, but I feel like our understanding of prayer has grown. It's not just about getting God to do what we want anymore. It's about how does this practice of prayer form us as a community. That, that's a huge leap forward. And then finally, another area I've seen us grow in is the area of mission, particularly in regard to justice and service. I mean, think about just the last year, what we've been a part of. You know, there's a group of guys that uh, help try to uh, in demand in the sex trafficking world through the Epic Project with these weird cyber control things we've been doing. There's a, you know, our community spent a good amount of money, invested a lot of money to buy a, a strip club up in the Coley neighborhood to convert into a community space. Um, we've got a, a group of people that are going to start to gather together to talk about what Evergreen's role in um, racial justice and reconciliation could be. Uh, I mean, there's so many things. We've got people step up to serve at home PBX regularly. I mean, this is an area that's a huge growth. Uh, we've seen huge growth in this year. It's awesome to see. So one of the things in kind of looking back and realizing that is now looking forward and seeing, well, what, is that, what does that mean for us in 2015? What is that growth area going to be? Where do we need to focus our attention and invest in where are we at in this process of, of communal maturing? Where do we need to grow? What's our next developmental milestone? So those are some of the questions that we've been asking. And there's been one thing that I feel like has probably stood out for a while, but has, has caught our attention more uh, as we think about the future of Evergreen. There are a couple of, uh, well, there are a number of really of passages that deal with this. Um, I'm just going to read a, a few of you, and you can kind of see the common thread here about that, that thing uh, that we need to focus on. First, uh, Thessalonians 3.12 says, And may the Lord make your love for one another, I think we're really good at that, by the way, and for all people grow and overflow, just as our love for you overflows. Second Peter uh, 1, there's this great uh, passage about this, this process of maturing. And he says, in view of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. And moral excellence with knowledge. Knowledge with self-control. Self-control with patient endurance. Patient endurance with godliness. And godliness with brotherly affection. Brotherly affection with love for everyone. 
the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you didn't see it, there's kind of this common thread. They're not just in these two passages, but are in a lot of passages. Is, is the love for all people. And I guess the question is, when we talk about what does our community's love for all people look like, is what, is that, what does it look like to love all people? What, what are they talking about? What are they referring to when they encourage that? What does it mean to love other people, particularly for us, those that are outside, so to speak, of, of our community, the people that are a part of Evergreen? One thing I know is that in a church's development, there becomes, over time, with, with our focused attention, a stronger focus on those who are outside of our church community. The heart of the Jesus story is, and we've talked about this, well, hopefully we talk about this every week, the heart of the Jesus story is the great news of the availability of God's kingdom to all people. That God is inviting all of us into his kingdom to, be, to, to belong, to be a part of what he's doing and what he's done. Jesus is the climax of Israel's story. He has done what God's people could not do, and he invites us to join him in what he has accomplished for us. That's the good news. That we can be a part of restoring and renewing all things with him of being a light to the world. And that good news is meant to be shared to all people. It's not exclusive. And I think that's one major thread in the New Testament of what it means to love everyone. It, it means to share, God's, to share in God's desire that everyone would come to know Him. Isn't that what Scripture says? It's God's desire that no one should perish. That everyone should have eternal life, shared life with Jesus. And we need to share God's desire in that. To know that, that God loves us, forgives us, invites us in, relates to us, and even likes us. And that's what Jesus is coming to us, dying for us, raising to life again means. It's what it shows us, what it proves to us. And I think it's in that aspect of mission... That is our next developmental milestone as a community, <coughs> is to grow in that area, to grow in that passion. It's growing in our desire and ability to talk about what, has, what God has done in our lives and for the world in a way that is natural, that makes sense with the people that we love. Not in a way, obviously, that is patronizing or, or cheesy or formulaic or scripted or manipulative. But how does the good news of Jesus, this message that we gather to preach to one another every week, how does that get out? How is that shared from us to other people that we love? How does the good news of Jesus get shared relationally with friends and family and co-workers? I think we've done a really good job of figuring out how to share Jesus through our example, through our character, through our service, through our love for justice. But I think the challenge for us this year is figuring out how do we share the good news of Jesus through our relationships and our words? I think that's always been an area that, you know, that we need a little, a little encouragement in. Because the thing is, the service piece that we've, we've grown so good at is necessary for mission, right? And as that's part of us, it's huge. But it's not sufficient for mission. The service justice and the, the relational sharing piece of mission naturally belong together. And unfortunately, I think these two, these two aspects of mission get, get pitted against each other as if they're competing somehow. I'm kind of like, well, you know, you go ahead and share the gospel through your words, and I'll, uh, I'll continue to do it through my example and service. Kind of, you know, you, you get that vibe sometimes. That somehow those things are are, uh, are in competition. But, but I've always wondered, doesn't that all belong together in what the New Testament talks about as our witness for Christ? Aren't those two things supposed to be joined? To, to, to put those two things against each other is kind of like asking, uh, Bob asked this question this week, like asking 
you, but what's the most important thing in a car, the engine or the transmission? <laughs> you need a boat to get anywhere, right? And I think similarly, the mission that God has given us in making disciples will always require both our words and our actions. You can't, you can't separate those things. So I want to invite you, Evergreen, this year, if you haven't in the past, I know some of you are passionate about this, but if you haven't in the past, let's get serious this year in, in praying for and investing in our friends, our co-workers, our family, our annoying neighbors, our acquaintances that don't know Jesus yet. Experience that, and he would experience the joy of baptizing me. 
He didn't know that, that we both would go to Bible college to pursue lives of ministry. He didn't know. For all he knew, I would, I would laugh at him, which he probably had every expectation for me to do. Or tell him no, or, or stop hanging out with him and his weirdo Christian friends. He didn't know. But he asked. And I went. And here we are. And what he also didn't know is that God had been active in my life way before that. He didn't know that, that I found myself strangely intrigued and comforted by this, this Bible that my grandpa gave me when, when childhood was tough. that left their mark on me through the years. And the point of all that is that before Bill ever asked me to go to church, God had already done most of the work. And what sharing the good news of God's love requires is a faith that God is already working in people's lives way before we show up on the scene. You know, I, I realized that my greatest fear in talking with my friends about what God's doing in my life or simply inviting them to, to home group or, or to church gathering, is that I lack the trust that God is already pursuing them for a variety of means. I just forget. I forget that, that, that I'm not like bringing God to anybody and He's already pursuing them. That's where my greatest failure to do that comes from, I think. But it's in God's very nature to pursue. He pursues us out of his pursuit of us flows out of his love. I love this passage in uh, Psalm 23, verse 6, where David says, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. I like the message even better. The message translation says, Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. God is on a relentless pursuit to capture the heart of each of us. These people that you, you see in the coffee shop in the morning, or you see at the gym, or you see running around your neighborhood, or in the grocery store at work, God's beauty and love is chasing after them every day of their life. Many of them don't recognize it. And what's exciting is that we get the incredible privilege of helping people to see it, to understand it. That's part of the mission that God has given to us as his church. And I think that's our challenge this year at Evergreen, that we would become a community who is passionate about sharing the good news of Jesus with our friends and our family and our neighbors in our relationships and with our words. You know, in a, in a Sunday like this, you, you, you might expect us to talk about the future of our community in terms of, you know, our, our stated desire to start new churches or uh, to get a permanent space of our own to gather, to serve the city, uh, to take better care of our kids, to have better facilities, etc. But that's really, as I was thinking about this week, it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. Because what we need to recognize is, is what's going to get us there 
What's going to get us to that point is our increased participation in God's mission with our relationships. It's when we start inviting and investing in our friends that, that we really start growing and need to plant churches because there are new communities of faith popping up in different neighborhoods. You know, even in seeing all this, as I got to close up here, even in seeing all this, I know that obviously not all of us in the room would consider ourselves Christians. Some of you have grown up in the church and are kind of on the fence. Uh, some of you are still wondering if you can be a part of a church again. Or if you can even still be a Christian. And so, you know, you, you hear this and you're like, well, I'm definitely not about to share what God means to me when I'm not really sure. And if you're in that place, I, I want to invite you, for those who are on the, on the fence, who are seeking, who are exploring, what I want to challenge you to do this year is this, is to continue to wrestle. Don't be passive in your search for God. Don't be content to not know. Actively pursue God. Consider being a part of some kind of discipleship and, and seeing if that doesn't help answer some of the questions that you have. Be a part of a theology hub. Talk with Bob or, or Amy or myself or one of the other elders about some of your questions and your problems with faith. You know, I, honestly, just in this role of pastor, I, I wish more people would, would sit down with me and say, you know what, I really have a hard time believe this, believing this Bible is somehow inspired by God. That's my biggest problem. Like, can we talk about that? I would love to talk about that. Or, like, you know, in the Old Testament, it appears that God is, is pretty much commanding Israel to commit genocide. That's a real problem for me. Is, is, there, is there some way to understand this? Man, I wish I could have more of those conversations. I wish more people would sit down and, and, and say, you know what, this is my problem, these are my doubts, let's talk about them. I hope we're the place that we can do that. But all that to say, don't let questions linger. Don't let your intellectual or emotional barriers just be. Do something about those. And for those who are very new to this whole thing, or just kind of checking things out, or trying to figure out who Jesus is, I want to invite you this year to belong. To get to know the good people of Evergreen. To discover who Jesus is. To ask questions. To examine and observe others and what it looks like for these people to follow Jesus. What it means to their lives. I mean, there, there are so many people here that would love to, to help you out with that, to read through a gospel with you, to, to figure out who Jesus is and, and why he came. All that to say, Evergreen, I, I'm really excited about 2015. I think we've grown so much in the last few years and have such a great foundation as a community to build on. Regardless of, of what happens with our Sunday gathering space or where we're meeting to worship, I'm confident that God is going to continue to grow us and mature us this year in being a community who is passionate about sharing the good news of God's love with the city of Portland, beginning with those who are closest to us. I want to end by just giving you a minute of silence to, to contemplate, to reflect, to consider this question. Who is it that God is putting on your heart and mind to be praying for this year? Who do you know that needs the good news of Jesus? And will you commit to praying for them this year? Let's take a minute and just be silent and listen. And I'll pray for us. God, so many of us have been so greatly impacted by the, the understanding of the, the gospel, the work of the gospel in our hearts and our lives. Many of our lives have been altered drastically from the time we first heard this good.
peace of God's love for us. God, thank you for your love, for your persistence in pursuing us. This year we ask that you would help us, you would encourage us, you would challenge us to be a community that is known for our love for all people. That we would be a community that is passionate about sharing and living the good news amongst the people that we love. God, help us to be, um, help us to be confident and trusting that you are doing so much that we can't see. Let them become certain path. And so many of our friends and neighbors and family are ready to hear the good news of the gospel. God, out of that confidence, may we have the um, may we grow in our ability to share the good news. We come to the communion table today, God, and great thankfulness for what you've done in our lives. The fact that you would give your body and blood for us so that we may have life. God, of that gratefulness, may we be a light to the world. Amen. We're going to sing a few songs and as we do this morning, I invite you up to the communion table in front here. Take communion as we remember, uh, which is a sick for us in our house.